The reasonable man conforms to the world. The unreasonable man bends the world to his will. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. My favorite quotes. Oh my God, it's so good. And I'm always telling people on my team, like, because people often look at me and say, like, you're being unreasonable. And I'm, yes, but like, <laughs> literally, we all limit our, we don't even try because we think something is impossible. And therefore, you guarantee that it is. It is literally shocking how much farther you can go when you, my wife and I call it no bullshit, what would it take? Just like in, you, you put yourself in problem solving mode rather than problem finding mode, which most yes. people live there. And you're just like, okay, there is a solution. It might not be something I'm willing to do, but there is a solution. And when you get into that mode and then actually have the willingness to keep going, it's freakish what you can accomplish. But most people just never let themselves be that aggressive. Yeah, I think I have a philosophy I teach everybody on all my teams. I have 105 companies now. It's mind boggling in all it's these insane. radically different industries. We're now doing almost $7 billion in business. I had no business background, but it's a certain <laughs> core philosophy that allows you to grow anything. And it, but it starts with the people themselves. And my whole thing is one choice is no choice. Two choices is the dilemma, there's always three choices. Like you said, I may not like the choice, but it's there. But more importantly, I think it's getting people to see that what they thought was possible, impossible is possible. The more you can give people an experience, like talk's cheap, but I've done enough things in my life with enough people at this stage, I've got a track record where it's like, I said it's gonna happen. Most people say it's probably true. It's probably likely he's gonna pull it off. Maybe I should jump on board, but the, the mindset has to be destroy any limitation and move forward, move forward, move forward. There is a way, move forward. And I think uh, if you watch this, it's like taking off on a plane from, you know, I'm in Texas right now. If I flew from Dallas here to go to Hawaii, you're of course about 90% of the time, I'm a pilot. Now, what if every time you're off course, oh my God, I'm off course, oh, I should freak out. Oh my God, I'm off course again. But you know, you just tack back and forth and you land exactly where you wanna be three, four, 5,000 miles you know, away. And I think that's how we have to navigate. But most of us, and especially during these COVID times, most of us have been conditioned not to, to take a risk. People ask me all the time, what does it take to be happy? And I always tell them it's really simple. <laughs> One word, progress. Progress equals happiness. If you keep growing, you're gonna feel alive. And if you keep growing, you're gonna have more to give. And when you're growing and giving is when life is magnificent. It doesn't matter how many statues, Oscars they give you or Emmys or how much money you have in the bank. We've all seen people had all those things and I get the phone call because they're depressed or somebody commits suicide in that area. So it's really an inner game. And I think that's what's missing for us today. Everybody's focusing on the outside world and how there's a lot of things in the outside world you'll never be able to control. You can influence, but you can't control it. This your mind, your emotions, your body. You have 100% control over what you do with these things. And that's where the game is won. You win the inner game, then you win the outer game. But a lot of people spent their life trying to win the outer game, they won and they're miserable. So to me, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And so many people are focused on success still, which to me is like, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's like success is getting what you want. Fulfillment is living what you're made for. You know, and it's like fulfillment and success, they're not even the same universe. And there's mm. nothing wrong with going for success, but you, you really got to figure out what you're made for. And nobody knows in the beginning. So you start where you are and you do what's in front of you, you do what's next. And you keep growing until you start to discover, hey, this is my real passion. This is my real hunger and drive. And it can change. People go for five, six, seven years, and then they usually question their business, their career, their, their body, their relationships. And then one of two things happens. They change direction and feel renewed, or they go, no, I got a great deal here. What the hell's wrong with me? And they recommit and they get stronger. But that's life. And if you don't grow, I don't give a damn how much you got going for you, you're gonna be miserable. No, man, I totally agree. That's something that I heard from you many years ago that I've repeated so many times. It's so true. I think the way that I first heard you say it is, progress is a foundational pillar of human happiness. Yes. I was like, damn, like that's so true. That idea of it just really sits at the foundation. I want to give you a Tony Robbins quote. Uh, and this is something going back to something you were just saying that I, I agree with uh, incredibly well or, or very much, which is uh, people have become hypnotized by a culture of weakness. And I was like, damn, like Tony's calling us out here. Uh, I agree with that. What, what is going on? And how do we shake out of it? Well, if you're a student of history, 
there is a cycle of history that is plain as day. Good times create weak people. Weak people create bad times. Bad times create strong people. Strong people create great times. This is the cycle of history. Thousand years of Roman history. There's a great book I recommend anyone read. I read it in 1997. It's not a beautiful read, but you need to understand it. It's called The Fourth Turning. Or you could read the book Generations, but it's about 700 pages, 800 pages. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton gave me that book and that's where I started. And it explains how our thinking, our process is so affected by the way we're raised generationally, the experiences we go through. So let me give you an example of why we're having challenges today and why I'm more than hopeful. Let's say you were born in 1910. Now think about this way first. Remember I talked about pattern recognition, pattern utilization, pattern creation. What gave humanity its greatest jump in its capacity was pattern recognition around seasons. Up until that time, we were hunter-gatherers, barely able to survive. It all depended on what was happening in the environment. We were dependent on the outside world. But once we understood the seasons that planting in the springtime and then taking care of through the summer, boy, in the fall you can reap. And then there's gonna be winter and you gotta hang on to this stuff so you can survive. Once we recognized that pattern, humanity transformed. Communities were created, eventually cities and countries and states, right? So think of it this way. There's also a pattern of your history as a human. 0 to 21, 19 to 2021 20, is a springtime where everything's easy. It's easy to grow. Growth happens. You don't have to do squat. Your body grows, life grows. And some of us had a more protected childhood. Some of us had no protection. We had to step up and take care of things when we we're seven or eight years old. But regardless, overall, it's a time in which people look out for you. You're taught things. You consume what you're taught. But once you come 19, 20, 21, roughly, and sometimes it's 16 for some people, 25 for others, but you get the picture, you enter a new season of life. You go to the summertime where you start testing and go, well, this is what I was taught, but do I really believe this shit? You know, this is what people say, but now I'm in a relationship, you know? And so all of this, this next 20 years is an explosive growth period if you work at it from 21 to 41. From 42 to 62, is a reaping time if you planted really in the spring and you pushed hard through the summer, you're gonna reap. Now, if you didn't plant in the springtime, you're gonna weep in this season. <laughs> you know, you're gonna be like, I don't have any money, I don't have any time, I don't know what to do, where am I going? But that's a season of power. That's when you really start to be able to lead companies, businesses, environments, and so forth. And again, some people get there earlier, some later, but it, overall, generationally, that's it. And then 63 to 83 is winter, and that winter time is a little different for somebody, right? Now that time is, maybe it's time, I'm an elder in the community, now it's time for me to mentor, to communicate. And if you're lucky, it goes 83 to say 103, or the oldest living human is about 119, if you were lucky enough to do that. Maybe you get an extended period of time where you enter the next springtime. So there's seasons that you gotta understand because if you plant in the winter, I don't care how hard you work, you get no reward. If you bought a house, sounds wonderful, in 2007, normally great, 2007, probably not so great. You're probably just starting to do okay in the last three or four years, right? So there's a timing to things. There's a timing in your life. There's also a timing in history. So imagine you were born in 1910. When would you come of age? 19 years old, 1929. What did you grow up with? World War I ended during that time, the whole world celebrated, and the roaring 20s began, and you're in your teens, cars, radios, parties, you can't wait to turn 19, 20, 21, right? And what happens? For that generation, right at that stage of life, the whole game, the, the wolves pull out from it, and people are jumping out of buildings, the economy goes to the floor, we got the dust bowl, but it didn't end there. Because what happened when they were 29, 1939, World War II, and you and I are too young to know it, but those around know that it looked like we were going to lose. Hitler was storming across Europe. It looked like life as we know it was over. And these people went overseas and became heroes. They faced such unbelievable, they were, they were thought as flappers, they were thought as weak, they were a lot like a lot of the generation that you see today, you know, the, you know, Z generation, not so much because they're just coming up, right? But the millennial generation, my older people, I see them as weak. You know, they're snowflakes, they're this and they're that, but they have technology, they have insights. And when the outside world is demanding enough, not yet, because they're still fearful, they will grow. 
And that's when things change. And so the season occurs. So think about the difference between the 30s and the 40s versus the 50s versus the 60s as we came after 63 into an American summer as a different mindset versus the 80s to the 2000s, 2000s. So we're right now halfway through winter. We're in another winter. It starts financially. Now it's gone to health, but we're far from it. It's going to be war. And it might be cyber war, it might be full on war, but there's zero question that China and the US are in a collision course that's going to shape the direction of humanity. And so the people that right now are alive today are gonna to have to grow in that environment. I really think we're at a season where there's gonna be a whole new level of growth. And what I just wanna do is be one of the many sources that can give people perspective, because here's the problem. A year ago, People thought we were coming out of, you know, we've got vaccines now and we're coming out of COVID and it's going to be all over now. And people are excited. But now after going through two years of this, there's a lot of people now that no longer have a compelling future. Like, you know, people talking about New Year's resolutions. Most people don't even have one because it's like they never followed through anyway. right? But at least they had something to look forward to. They're starting to get into learned helplessness. Learn helplessness yeah, is, is when something is so bad over and over again, you start thinking the problem's permanent. No problem is permanent. Or you start thinking the problem's pervasive because I haven't handled my finances, my whole world's over. Or because my relationship's bad, my whole world's over. Your life is bigger than that. Or all this is happening because there's something wrong with me. When you get to that point, you stop trying. And so my goal right now is to shake that up for people. People need a new perspective and you can't do it by just sitting and thinking. You got to move your body. You got to change your energy and your focus because low level of energy. I don't think I'm getting how smart you are. You're not going to use all your ability. But if I get you into a higher state of being mentally, emotionally, physically, then all of a sudden you start remembering who you are and you start coming up with answers that you never even thought were possible before. The idea of remembering who you are is something incredibly powerful. There was a uh, Batman cartoon where he gets amnesia. And he gets put in like a, a camp, basically a work camp and he can't get out. And then one day and he feels stuck and weak and, you know, afraid. And then he, something happens. I don't remember what triggers his memory. And he remembers that he's Batman. And all of a sudden, just in remembering that he's Batman, he then takes the actions to fight his way out. And look, I know it's a cartoon, but that has always resonated with me. And whenever I'm feeling anxious about some, but something, I always tell myself, remember who you are. And yep. there, there's so much power, even though I know that it's BS because I am also the guy that's afraid. But there's that's something called incredibly that's called powerful. Being human. But you're really talking about the most important concept in lasting change, identity. We all define ourselves in certain ways. And most of us defined ourselves years ago, and we haven't done an update and now you're in an environment where you're constantly told how bad it is, how terrible it is. So that stimulates the old part of the human brain, the fight or flight mechanism, the part of your brain that's always looking for what's wrong. So you can hide from it, you know, or you can fight it or you can freeze and hope it doesn't notice or you can run from it. And so that part of our brain is never going to make you happy. It's an important part. There's no saber tooth tiger for us to run from anymore or fight. Right? Not for most people. But now we get that about what are people saying about me online? <laughs> or, you know, or do I have enough money in a country that even if you have very little money in America, even if you're in quote unquote a poor environment, you know, I, I support, I provide a hundred million meals a year. I've done, I'm almost to a billion meals now. I'm at 825 million meals to give you an idea in the last Incredible. seven years. So I'm into helping everyone I possibly can, but you got to help them here and here too. You know, so I use the food as the excuse to get into here and here and start showing people what's possible. And I think we're in a place right now where a lot of people are in this learned helplessness and they don't realize, you know, if you, if, if as an identity, if identity is how you've identified yourself and you see yourself as a procrastinator, why? Because you procrastinate so many times and disappointed, you don't want to be disappointed. So now you're a procrastinator, you're no longer disappointed. You feel certain, you'll never have your goals, but you feel certain. That's what most people do in their life. But if you set, let's say, a thermostat in this room at 78 degrees and the temperature drops far enough, something's going to happen because the computer's going to go, hey, 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 you're at 78 degree. What are you doing here at 68? And the heaters kick on and suddenly you get this drive. I'm sure your listeners or viewers have had this experience many times in their life. We're finding us not another day. Not, I'm changing this relationship. I'm losing this weight. I'm going to finally do something. And then you push, push, push. Now, some people push, 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 and they go beyond their comfort zone, beyond what they expect, not their goals. It's what they're used to. It's their comfort zone. 
And let's say that 68 degrees is where they're used to financially. It's not what they want or their relationship or spiritually or physically. And they grow to 88, 98, 99 degrees. Suddenly the brain goes, hey, hey, what are you doing here? You're, you know, you're, you're not a 99 degree -er. And then all of a sudden the heaters stop and you lose your drive. And if that's not a bad, the air conditioners kick on and you start to sabotage and you go, what happened to my life? So identity is the number one thing I work to change with people, to expand it, not to get rid of it, but expand your own sense of who you really are and what you're capable of. And people think they're going to get identity by, like people say to me, I have no self-esteem. I hate that word. It's so overused and abused. I don't have any self-esteem because when I was growing up, my parents said these terrible things and those terrible things. And I said, isn't it convenient you only remember those things? <laughs> so, you know, I, they said a million things, but suddenly you was honed in on those. But let's get real. Someone can tell your whole life you're a piece of crap, and you can say, screw you, read between the lines and make your life work. Someone can tell your whole life you're beautiful, you're intelligent, you're the smartest person in the world, and you don't believe it. Because self-esteem doesn't come from what people say about you. Self-esteem is earned within yourself. It's esteem for yourself, which only comes by doing things that are incredibly difficult. And then your brain goes, this is who I am. The reason I've done firewalks for years, I used to do skydiving, but you know, it's hard to get 30,000 people in the middle of the air above New York in the middle of the night. But the reason I did these metaphors was because when someone does something they once thought was difficult or impossible, and you get the other side, the brain goes, if I can get myself to do this, what else can I get myself to do? It changes their identity. When your identity expands, your whole world expands. Dude, fire walking at your event was crazy. It was really cool because I had always said to my wife, I would walk across fire for you. And so at the event, at the event, it is like you are trying to fuck with people. You are like, you spend hours warning about like how wrong it could go. You have to be so careful. And so I was like, okay, wait, is he trying to freak me out? So this is like a bigger deal. And then as you're walking up to it, you feel the heat and you're like, oh shit. Like these are actually hot. And yeah. people start peeling out of line, right? They just can't bring themselves to do it. And I'm like, look, I may end up with charred stumps for feet, <laughs> but I told my wife I would walk across fire for her. I'm walking across <laughs> this fucking fire. It was really meaningful. Like as one of those things and, you know, and I get it and you guys try to make it as safe as possible, but it really meant something to me to, to say, like, I told her I would do this. I'm doing this. And then you do it. It was dope. I, and you know, uh, you see people who go there go, I'm not going to do this no matter what. I'm just coming for the seminar. And other people think I'm going to do this. And they get out there and freak out. Like you said, they peel off. But you were there by the end. You know, about 99% of the people do it. We don't force anybody or push them to do it. But you go through so many changes in here. It's like, that's what we need today. We need to re-engineer ourselves. If you've ever seen one of these Baja races, you know, a thousand miles in the desert or, you know, there's a million different races that if you took a normal car, you'd be out of it and probably die in the first day or so. But what they've done is re-engineer the shock absorbers, the size of the tires, the engine system. And we need to re-engineer ourselves for winter. We need to re-engineer ourselves so that we can thrive, not just survive during this time. And that's what I'm seeing people do in their life and their businesses. I mean, it's it's been really, I know it sounds crazy, but it's been one of the more beautiful times. I hate the fear that's been generated in so many people unduly. I mean, this CDC themselves, I wrote this in my book. There's a section in my health book, and I quote directly from the CDC. What's the number one risk factor other than age? 80% of people die of COVID, 79.8% are overweight and obese, extremely overweight. Something you can easily do something about, nobody talks about. And number two is fear, because the anxiety makes people change their breath. They can't fully oxygenate. So it's like, there's a lot within our control if we just wake up. But the beautiful part of COVID is a lot of people waking up to what's possible, seeing where it is, seeing how they could change their entire business. Because when things happen and they're gonna be unjust things, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter what country you're from, injustice is everywhere. It's gonna happen to all of us at various times, right? Or it may not just be injustice, just like, wow, you got cancer. I mean, it's like, you know, what I do to deserve this? It isn't like that. It's not something you earn by brownie points. It's like, okay, what am I gonna do with what life has brought me? And my greatest growth that's helped me help so many other people is because, you know, someone tells me I, I got a tumor in my brain and I'm gonna die. And I'm like, I don't accept that, right? I got a torn rotator cuff and there's, you know, you're gonna have to go through six months of rehab. I'm not gonna accept that. There's gotta be another way, you know? And so, and, and the things you can't control, you learn to learn how to accept and learn from, you know? And so I think, 
COVID has offer, offered that opportunity. I'm reaching more people because of it. I'm touching more lives. I'm having an impact. I, you know, my wife and I have tried to have a child for quite many years. I have five grandkids and I have uh, four kids, now five, but I have a nine month old now. I have a 48 year old daughter and a nine month old daughter. Give me my <laughs> That's incredible, man. So that's the gift of COVID because I was home. <laughs> we can say, let's give it another shot. There you go. Uh, I want to hit you with another Tony Robbins quote. And um, this one, I think, sums up what you're saying here. Uh, you cannot fear change and do everything the way it's always been done. And so fear you talk a lot about. But man, I have people in my life that are older than me, and many of them they are calcifying as they get older. And I watch what really served them well in their 20s and 30s. And I may have um, discussed this with you before, but I'm haunted by a quote that genius is a young man's game. And as a late bloomer, that never sat well with me. But when you look at people that win Nobel prizes, it's almost always for work that they do in their early 30s. They get awarded in their 60s, but they did the work in their 30s. And seeing how you're going after like cutting edge stuff. Um, I know one of the companies, I think you sold it to Apple uh, in the AR VR space, if I remember correctly. Um, I've heard you talking about Bitcoin for years now. Uh, I know you know about NFTs. Like it's how are you so able to embrace change and how the hell do you stay this enthusiastic in a world that changes this fast as you get older, why are you not like so many people are crippled by that? They just want things to stay the same. I think as early on, I realized, that, you know, one of the things you have to understand about life is everything changes and everything ends. And that kind of sounds heavy on the front end, but it's a truth. If everything changes and everything ends, number one, it should make you appreciate what you have right now. And then my view is what's next is always better. If I make it so, it's my job to make it so. And so I think, you know, for me, I look at it and say, you know, when you said uh, genius is a young man's game, I think that's total bullshit. Um, I think passion is the genesis of genius. If you've got enough passion, you're going to find answers nobody else does. But most people run out of fuel, meaning they get tired, they get exhausted, they get burnt out, they get, uh, you know, the law of familiarity. They're around something so much, they take it a little bit for granted. And I've managed to see something in myself that I found in every great leader that I've ever respected. And that is, I I, I value intelligence immensely, but I know really smart people can't fight their way out of a paper bag pragmatically, right? I'm sure you do too. What I see is the one common denominator of people that are successful over a lifetime is the sustained hunger. Mm -hmm. Hunger is the number one factor. When I see somebody, I don't give what age they are, I don't care what their background is. If they're hungry to improve, to change, to make something happen. I mean, if you look at Richard Branson, he's as hungry today in his late 60s as he was at 16 years old in that Crip starting Virgin. If your mission is achieving excellence, you must support your body. Introducing AG1. This powerhouse blend is packed with 75 premium vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients that elevate your immune system, uplift your mood, and promote restful sleep. And Athletic Greens is offering our listeners a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Don't miss this opportunity to optimize your health and truly be legendary. You know, you look at my buddy, Mark Benioff, you know, he's like, he's kind of like in his early fifties right now. Mark is more hungry today than when I knew him 12, 14, 15 years ago when he was first coming up with the idea of, so I'm going to, you know, he went to one of my seminars over and over again, the UPW, you know, which one, and he went there like four or five times and he was sitting in the front row. He's a tall guy, he introduced himself and said, you've convinced me. I'm going to leave this company I work for as an employee here. And I'm going to go start this new company called salesforce.com. Wow. And he says, Tony, we're going to do a hundred million dollars in business. And we're going to change business. Now he's doing whatever, 30 billion right now. <laughs> it's, but it's because he hasn't lost the hunger. And I think the law of familiarity is what destroys a relationship. You get around somebody enough, you love them, but you don't have the same passion, same aliveness. And I'm just not willing to settle for a life without passion and aliveness. That's just like, there's so much to learn. There's so much to grow. There's so much to give. And I'm, I'm wired to grow and give. And I, I, I think anybody gets wired to grow and give is gonna have a really fulfilling life. It doesn't matter what you choose to do, you're gonna be alive because you're gonna make progress. And because you made progress, you have something to give. And we all, 
like some people think they just want to get, but you get, 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 and it's pretty damn boring and it doesn't really expand your sense of identity of who you are. But if you're constantly growing and then taking what you learn, you're so excited about it, you share with other people and their life gets better, whether that be software you make or dresses you design or, you know, something you do in the health space that really gets people to enjoy their food while they're eating well. If you have those passions and you keep growing, there's no limit. It doesn't matter what happens in the short term with a pandemic or with a drop in the economy or whatever the case may be. These are all temporary when you realize life is lived in decades, not in days. I've seen people in your own seminars that have been through things that are so traumatic, it's almost hard to believe that a human can put another human through something like that, but they do. How does somebody like that, who is gonna have a very hardwired sense of their own identity, of that they're broken in some fundamental way, that there's no way beyond that identity, and that's creating what I call a frame of reference. So it's the distortion you were talking earlier about, we distort things, is creating that distorted funhouse mirror that they're viewing their world through. How do you, because I know somebody uh, that's been through something like that, when they hear all this, it just sounds too facile. It's, it's too easy. You're just making it sound so simple. Yeah. What's well, the process for overcoming that trauma? Well, first, people get vested in their trauma. People get vested in their pain. If you want to know the largest drug on the planet, it's not cocaine. It's not heroin. Uh, it's not pot. It's not, you know, some prescription drug. The biggest, you know, drug on the planet is problems. Because everyone has a deep fear everyone. And the deepest fears we have are two. One is that we're not enough. We're not smart enough, young enough, rich enough, pretty enough, funny enough, something enough. And if we're not enough, it digs the deepest fear we have, which is we won't be loved. And love is the oxygen of the soul. So, you know, a baby is, if they're not physically kinesthetically loved, they develop what's called failure to thrive syndrome. That's how desperate our nervous system is for love. So human beings when they think, oh my God, if I fail at this, it'll look like I'm not enough and I won't be worthy of love. They tend to come up with a reason why that's either not their fault. It's something that was done to me. I got ADHD, I was born with it. I was raped, I was whatever. And they might even tell the truth. Someone may have really raped them, it's a horrible situation. But other people have raped and they've gotten through it and they're on the other side of it. This person hasn't because it becomes their reason for not being where they wanna be in their life. And so the bottom line is a mother can lose her daughter or son through a drunk driver and spend the rest of their life in pain. And another one creates mad mothers against drunk drivers and does something about it and feels a sense of freedom and a sense of serving that child and a sense of higher purpose in what they're doing. So it's not the problem. It's not the trauma. It's finding what they value more than the problem. And, and everyone has a place where there's something they value more than the trauma. Some people gather trauma because they realize I've been so traumatized loss of this child that my other child feels completely unloved. And they, they realize I'm losing that love. I'm losing that child. If I don't get my shit together, right? They need a higher level of what's called leverage. Leverage is what makes change a must, not a should. As long as it's a should, you'll have your story and your story could be a true story. And you'll tell your story and share your story with yourself or other people or both. And you stay stuck. But trauma is, you know, it is not, it's a bruise. It's not a tattoo right? Any bruise can be healed, but not unless you're vested in healing it. And what a lot of people do, I, I remember when I was diagnosed with a tumor in my brain, I've seen this happen so much that I didn't tell anyone. I didn't even tell my spouse at the time, the first day I was trying to process it because I didn't want people to start treating me differently. And so the only person who knew for the first day or two was my assistant because she had talked to the doctor. So before I'd even be able to tell my spouse at the time, all of a sudden, you know, everyone treated me like I was indestructible. I taught people to do that. It's like, cause I want to help everybody. So there was no, no, it's like, I'll do whatever it takes. Right. So it was, it was inhuman at the time. And suddenly my assistant starts saying, you know, we shouldn't book that right now. And we shouldn't do this right now. And I started getting love and attention and connection for having this problem. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I'm not, I'm not going to go down that slippery slope. But that takes a really conscious mind to do it. And, and lucky for me, I've had a chance to deal with millions of people. So I see these patterns all the time. But most people, their problem is their drug. It's the drug against the fear that I'm not enough and I won't be loved. Even if they go, no, it's me. I'm so messed up. What they're really saying is reassure me, love me. They're wanting that connection through their problem. So 
you got to decide there's something you value more than your problem. When you decide that, you can make it happen. But most people aren't going to do that unless they get in an environment where they see that happening. And what are you looking for? Like, do you have to first understand the story that they're telling themselves to help them unwind that? Like, when, when you're trying to dig into that, what are you looking for to leverage, to narrow the walls, to get them moving in a direction? I'm listening for something that they value more than their pain and or I'm trying to dig to find where that is. But I first try to figure out, like, if you think of, we all have a life story, right? Some people's life is a warning. Some people's life is an example. If your life's a warning, it still can become an example if you're alive, right? You, can, you have that choice. That's the greatest story of all time, the comeback story, right? So what I'm looking for is what's their story? And the story is driven by number one, what's their desire? If you go to a movie, read a book, in the first few minutes, the main character, you'll discover what their desire is. Is it to merge with God? Is it to find a great relationship and have children? Is it to free themselves from being enslaved? Whatever it is, there is a driving desire. And then there's always, as soon as you have a desire, there's a problem. Because right? otherwise you'd have your desire. And the problem usually is character piece is missing within yourself. You're being selfish. You're not giving enough. You're not creative enough. You're not trusting enough, something enough. And then as you go through the story of a person's life, what happens is they come up with a plan and there's always, you know, <laughs> the phrase, you know, if you want to make God laugh, tell her your plans, right? You know, so it's like the plan doesn't work. You end up having battles and the battles invariably are with external enemies, with intimate enemies, like who can hurt you more, the person you don't know or the person you love who seems to have betrayed you. And then there's the internal enemy, the conflicts within yourself. And as you fight through those battles, if you continue to grow, you come to a point where you have insights. You see what the real truth is. It isn't somebody else, it's me. This is what needs to shift. And if you see that and act on it, kind of jump through the opening, so to speak, then life's never the same again, or life is happily ever after, as it says in every story, right? Because you've made a shift in the core values and beliefs and emotions that are driving your life. So I look at it that way. I'm looking to see what's their story. And you want to change your life, change your story. Are they playing the position of the, the pawn? Are they the position of the king? Are they court gesture, right? Are they the martyr? You know, what, what is the role they're playing? What's the story they're telling themselves? And then I dig for something they value more. So for example, the woman that uh, was going to take her life and already given up all her stuff, um, in a few seconds of talking with her, so she mentioned something about her father who had just died. And so I asked her a little bit about her father. Both her father and mother had just died. She'd gone through sexual abuse and her brothers and sisters didn't want to talk about it. And as a result, they were estranged from her. And so she felt she had no friends, no anything, suffering financially and in a lot of physical pain. So all these things happening once, people say, guess what? Dying would be easier than living, which is not true. But if you believe it, you try to take your life. So as I dug in about her father, he grew up in the depression and he was extraordinary. And, and I could just see the respect and love for her father. So as I had her tell me these stories, and I said, well, how did he do that during that time when he had no money and people were jumping out of buildings? And, and, I, and I go deeper and deeper. And it's like, well, he just valued this. And he was he learned from his father. And, you know, he he never forgot these certain core lessons. And, and I said, oh, I said, that's interesting. And I said, so and what core lessons did you get from your father? And gradually I started to find where the resources were why is she not going to kill herself? Why? What's the leverage that I can use to get her to shift? And then you can watch this emotional transformation happen over about 45 minutes until it was so unbelievably emotional and complete at the end. It's like, no, I'm never going to take my life. I can't take my life. I'm not taking my life. And she starts to rebuild things. So really fast. I want to, I want to push in on that. So was it that what you were uncovering is that through her dad, she could see meaningful values that she already resonated with. And then it was about getting her to transpose those values from your, your putting them on your dad, but you can value those same things in yourself. Now you have a chance to live up to those values, which will help you change your story and your sense of identity. And that's gonna give you the meaning and purpose to pull out. That's the intellectual description of it, the emotional description <laughs> of it. Yeah, that, and which would not have moved her. Though that's the mechanics. What moved her is, I can't let my father down. He did let his uh -huh. father down the worst time. I can't let my father down. That's what I took her to. 
I, and then building a compelling future, what she can build, what she can do, what she does have the ability to make happen, what she has broken through, like tapping into the resources she deleted inside of herself and reactivating them so she feels alive again inside herself. Although all the other things you described are the structural intellectual impact of what actually happens, but that's not what changes somebody. It all comes from emotion. We are emotional creatures. We all study, like you're talking about it using your brain. You're such a smart person. I love you dearly. And you analyze it all. But your effing brain isn't going to do shit. What's going to do it is enough emotion. Well, emotion is the power. Emotion is what starts wars. It's what ends wars. Emotion is what gets you married. Emotion is where kids come from. Divorce is where emotion comes from. Everything that you can think of of a major change in humanity from the most extreme of war to the most gentle of love all come from human emotion. So it's the mix of emotion. It's like knowing what you want and having the right fuel to get there. And you have, if the fuel has no combustion, you're just bored, you're not going anywhere. If the fuel is total trauma and I'm overwhelmed, you just blow up and go nowhere. There's that delicate balance. And I've learned over the years how to help people find that balance. Okay, this is really interesting. And may you may have put your finger on the thing that I struggle with the most. The thing I find compelling is for sure um, being able to understand intellectually what's happening, because I've used that to change my own life. That is the thing that works on me. Um, do you at all I, feel- I would, I would ask you to consider something. Please. What you just said is absolutely true. I know you really well, and you know how much I respect and love you personally. And what you've accomplished in your life is extraordinary. What you're continuing to accomplish is extraordinary. But there's an emotional inflection that made you use those things in those moments. It wasn't just those understandings. If the emotion made you find the answers, brother, and then you have a really smart mind, you found the answers, figure out how to use it. But there are inflection moments that made you do it. There's a reason why you left your company after building it to a billion dollars. It wasn't intellectual. It was emotions. So, but you have developed your mind so much, it's like your right arm, your bicep is really strong. Your left one, not quite as much. And I'm inviting you to consider that your left one is your more powerful one. And you've used it in key moments. But it also, it's very protective to use the mind because we're all afraid to feel a little too much. So the more I can understand it, I put it out here, I can analyze it, I don't have to be in it. But the truth is where you're gonna, where your impact or your real, since impact theory, <laughs> where the real impact is, is when there's enough emotion that gets you to apply the things that you understand intellectually, right? Or find the yeah. answer that you, you didn't even have the answers. You found the answers intellectually because the emotion drove you. So it's really, studying what creates that emotion that makes the difference in anybody's life. That's where everything begins and ends is with emotion. And yet our society is all about up here. You know, in Chinese medicine, it's all about the heart, right? That's considered the center, right? In America, we think it's the brain. Now, you, you know, when you first are born, you know, your heart starts beating. That's how we know you're alive. And there is no brain yet. I mean, this literally is the initial sense of intelligence. That's why, you know, for thousands of years, even poets have talked about the power of the heart. Well, the heart has tremendous power and there's a biochemical connection between the brain and the heart that I know you know about. And learning how to use that is where you create more lasting change. When I was understanding it all, I was good. When I learned how to move people, I got great at what I was doing. Mm. Yeah, that, that feels like a really important statement. And now I'll give you a little more insight into part of what riles me up. The reason that people in self-help fall into snake oil salesman territory is some people are very good at orchestrating emotion, but they don't actually know how to create lasting change in people. And so it's bullshit. And so many people get caught up in that part. Well, that's and just I like, watch, like, that's like the pump up, right? They're pumped up and then it drops, right? It's gone. Right. Yeah. So that, that's my big fear, not necessarily with myself. I'm pretty good at getting myself to do what is useful to me in terms of moving me towards fulfillment, just to put a really brief cap on it. Yeah. But I, what do you think about, in fact, I'll ask it another way. How have you avoided falling into the realm of bullshit because so many people that mimic you, they only exist in the realm of getting people to feel something emotional, but you don't. So you uncover this, okay, I'm gonna make this about not letting your dad down, but the, a year later, and I'm just going back to the study now, a year later, people still have this lasting impact. So how and where are you translating it from the, all right, we're not gonna let your dad down, and this is how we're gonna do it? Because it's not enough, that's what, that provides the leverage. 
right? Now we've got to condition your nervous system to feel a different way in these contexts right now where you feel overwhelmed. And so I use emotion with precision. It's more like a laser. It's not a pump up. Uh, you know, people see a seminar with me and they see 10,000 people or 20,000 people in the stadium jumping. It's, you all know, it's not about jumping. It's using this scientifically to shift the biochemistry in that room. You know, the, the study they did at Stanford, they did, they, they followed me for three years and they put this $85,000 device on me that measures everything, heart rate variability, everything you imagine. And then every hour they came and took my saliva and some blood to see how my biochemistry was changing. It was so radical because they found out I jump a thousand times in an average day on stage, a thousand times. And I weighed 285 pounds. So every time you come down, it's four times the body weight when you hit. So imagine a million pounds times a thousand jumps, you know, million pounds of pressure basically going to my body in just one day. Um, my lactic acid, if you're speaking with somebody and you're running and there's a point you can't talk anymore because your lactic acid hit four. Well, I'm at 18, I'm still speaking. But the most crazy thing that they discovered was that they started measuring my audience as well. And it's wild. It looks, I, I know you know about mirror neurons, right? You can watch somebody and then you start to experience in your body what they're doing. Well, I take an audience all over the world, including people that are home in their houses, right? Now that we do these things digitally, we'll have 25,000 people in an event. We might have 10,000 people in front of me, another, you know, 15,000 at home in 100 countries. And they went out and they did the same tests on them. And they literally mirror my biochemistry. And there's something that they found in studying guys like Tom Brady. And they, they studied the, um, the Stanley Cup champions of Tampa Bay um, uh, Lightning and so forth is when they get to a stressful point, they call it the championship biochemistry. There's a place where your testosterone surges. So you have this incredible drive, right? It also makes you retain whatever you're thinking about. Because with the testosterone, you remember it, right? Because it creates a biochemical shift. But also cortisol, which is the stress hormone, drops through the floor. That's why Tom Brady can have a minute left and do these unbelievable type comebacks. He is in this zone. Well, that's where I am. And I take people biochemically into this zone and then I take them out deliberately to produce a little more fear, break it out. You know, I'm, I'm building muscles with them and you literally see, it looks like music to what's going on there. And then every single person that they tested goes through this biochemical change. So a year later, they didn't just have the leverage, oh, I'm doing this for my mom or new values or new beliefs. They had the biochemistry that's wired into them that gives them strength under stress. And that's why they're doing well a year later when Stanford follow up, they're like, couldn't believe it. How could 11 months later have this continued to improve? Well, with new beliefs and new values, you're improving your life, but also because it was wired with so much emotion, you've had a biochemical shift as well. And so the combination is answers your original questions. I said, you can't separate the mind and the body. I do both. When somebody just pumps people up, you know, and copies what I do in terms of the surface, they don't know what they're doing on the deep part. And some people do the deep part, but they don't quite frankly get everybody because they don't produce the emotional change. So people leave intellectually understanding why they're messed up and they can explain it to you, but nothing changes. It's the combination of those that produces real lasting transformation. All right. Talk to me about values concretely. Is there a generic set of values that everyone should be uh, living their life against? Is it all super unique to the individual? And how do we go about creating and making those values stick? It's a great question. When I was like 35 years old, I, for about a year, I asked everybody anywhere I went, taxi driver, what's most important to you in life? What else is most important? Which that's how you find out what people value most, right? And I was looking for that ideal set of values. And if we could all do that, and it just shows, you know, my level of development at 35, right? Thinking we all have one set of values. At different stages of life, we need to value different things. There are different lessons. There are predictable things that happen from zero to 21, not identical for everyone, but there's certain things. You're accumulating knowledge and skill. You're, you know, if you're lucky, if someone's looking out for you, most people have someone looking out for them at least for a period of that time. You go to 22 to 42, now you're testing what you were taught, all the things you were taught to believe. And then you find out, shit, relationships are a little more complex than I thought when you get into a deep, intimate one, right? And then you discover, well, shit, I'm not invincible. And so 22 to 42, if you work at it, you're the soldier of society and you're learning and you're growing and you're testing and now you're developing who you are. 43 to 63, roughly, in 20 year segments, some people, you know, I went to work when I was 11 years old, right? So I didn't start at 21, but you get the idea of the overall phases of life. But 43, 63, 
that's your power period if you worked hard in the first two seasons. If you planted in the spring and you took care of things during the summer and kept growing, then it's fall for you. That's the time when you have the greatest reaping in terms of business success, in terms of life, in terms of wisdom, in terms of understanding, and you get better in your relationships and you stop judging yourself so insanely, hopefully. And then from 64 to 84 to 104 to the oldest living humans, you know, 120, that's a different period. That's a period in which if you've done well in the beginning, you get to be the elder of the tribe and you get to be in a place where you get to mentor people and you want to, and it's not about you anymore because you live enough life to know that that's an empty promise. You know, there's only so much feelings you can have for yourself, you know, you know, buying things or music or drugs or sex or whatever. There's, you start to realize life has a higher and deeper purpose and it's about something more than me. Life's not about me, it's about we. And when that starts to happen to people, if they're healthy, if they took care of themselves in those first three stages, it's the most fulfilling time of life. All the research shows most fulfilling if you're healthy. So it's, that's kind of the, the racetrack of life and in gross sense of things. And then there's every one of us goes to those stages and we have different life experiences, but we also are placed in a different place in history. So right now we're in winter. It's not hard to figure this out. If I asked you, you know, if you were born in 1910 and, you know, what, what, what's life like as you're coming of age at 21? Well, that's when, you know, 1929 is when the stock market crashed and people are jumping out of buildings. So these people that saw World War I end as children and we were the heroes and they saw all this new technology, radio and TVs and cars, thought they're going to party. And right when they came of age, all hell broke loose for that 21 to 42, because once the depression was done, then we went into World War II. But that, that particular generational location duplicates every 80 years. That's where millennials are right now in some Z generation. That generation, by the way, was not respected. They were called flappers. They were irresponsible. But when the environment changed, they grew and they became known as the greatest generation. But think about it. They came home and had this time of prosperity and peace. The late 40s, 50s, until Kennedy was shot in 63, those are unique times. That's kind of springtime. It's easy to grow. Then there's the hot summer where there's fights within generations and values within the country. And that's, think about the 60s and 70s. And then the 80s, 90s, 2000s, very different than the 60s and 70s. So we're now in winter. Winter just means, it doesn't mean every day is a bad day. It just means the overall theme is fear. The overall theme is limitation. And people will get exhausted of it, just like they got exhausted of the 80s and the 90s of go, go, go. And it's all going to be me get rich. And it's all about me, 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 me. Now, those times are over. That gets exhausted. Winter, we're about halfway through it. If you study history, no one knows exactly when it is. The 20-year segments I'm giving you are generalizations. But we still got probably some war to deal with. That's usually what happens. There's economic war. And then there's war that's seen on a, on a world stage. And so we see what's happening now in Russia, what's happening in China. It might be a different kind of war. It might be a war that's, you know, turning off your electricity. It might be a cyber war, but we're going to go through some difficult times. But on the other side of it is spring. So the beauty is, you know, some winters are long, some are short. Some are hard, some are easy, but you never skip winter. You don't go from fall and reaping straight to spring. But when you go through winter and get strong, now, new springtime happens. If you do well in winter, if you take care of yourself and get strong, that's my goal to help people with right now. My goal is like, how do you help people right now? That's why, by the way, I'm doing the challenges that I'm doing now, because since COVID happened, people are stuck at home. I was like, how can I help a mass number of people? And I don't want money to be in the way. I don't want anything to be in the way. So I do a five-day challenge, about two, usually sometimes three hours a day. I tell them one and a half, two hours, but I, I want to give more. I charge nothing for it. And we have, in the last three years, a million people participate in each one of these things. And it's free. I'm just showing people what to do with their body, what to do with their mind, what to do with their emotion, what to do with their relationship, what to do with their business. Because winter is scary for most people with a career or business. You know, you see all the layoffs happening in the tech business. You see the challenges we've all gone through from COVID and now new challenges with inflation. All this is coming. So what are you going to do? Give up? Well, some people are going to hope. That's no strategy. Some are going to give up. Other people are going to retool themselves. And so that's my skill set. I'm made for winter. So you become more unshakable. And what I mean by unshakable is it's not that nothing bothers you. It's just that when everybody else is freaking out, you have perspective. You know how to take advantage of the situation. You have a plan. You know what to do. Because financially, these times are the best times in the world to make money. You know, the Depression, more people became millionaires in the Depression than any time in history. You know, John F. Kennedy's father, Joe Kennedy, 
You know, he had $3 million in 1929. He had $62 million, the equivalent of $3 billion three years later. Because oh. when things are going rough, people give up and freak out and opportunity shows up for those that keep their heads straight. So whether it's your relationship or whether it's your body or whether it's your finances, I've spent a lifetime collecting the best strategies and tools. Obviously, everything you've put out has had a huge impact on my life. I want to go back to values as it relates to depression and changing where you're at in your life. So I have a thesis that I think um, may play into why you're focused on getting people to be unshakable, what that's all about. My thesis goes like this, that fulfillment is the ultimate game of life. Fulfillment has a, uh, a recipe, and that recipe is that you need to do really hard things because um, evolution demands it, quite frankly. So you have to do really hard things in order to make progress, which is something I've stolen directly from you, which is progress is a foundational pillar of human happiness, uh, which I think is so true. And so you're working really hard to gain a set of skills that is the sense of progress that allow you to serve not only yourself, but other people. And if you do that, then you get in a very virtuous cycle of gaining mastery at something. So you're getting better at something that's allowing you to serve other people. You're getting feedback from them that, whoa, you've made my life better, which then makes you want to work harder, gives you meaning and purpose. So when I think about values in that light, I think about things that need to be aligned with the reality of that formula, which I will say is a, a gift or a curse, depending on how you look at it, of evolution. And it just, it is the necessary thing for you to survive long enough to have kids that have kids. That's the, for a social creature anyway, that's the formula. And so when I think about unshakable, I think about it in that light of nature demands that you work hard at something, that you earn it, that it has been difficult, that you persevere and push through it, that the thing that you're pushing through and persevering is meant to allow you to transform potential into actual usable skill set. That's progress so that you can serve. Does that land for you or is there something that I'm missing? No, it absolutely lands. The, the simple way I always describe it is there's two skills you got to master to have life on your terms, to have an extraordinary life. To me, an extraordinary life is life on your terms. It's not my life. So what is it for you? For some people, that's, uh, you know, a white picket fence and three children. For some people, it's building a big business. For some people, it's being an author. It's like so many different things, poetry, music. So everybody's got to find it is what it is that they really love. But the skills you got to master to have life on your terms is one, the science of achievement. That's what you're describing. How do I take what I envision and make it real? And those are strategies and they are proven strategies. There are certain rules of the game. If you want to be healthy and you want a lot of energy, everyone's biochemically slightly different, but there's certain rules. If you violate them, you're going to have low energy and dis-ease. If you align with them, you're going to have enormous energy and strength. Same thing around finance. Anyone can grow financially, but most people don't learn the basic fundamentals. And so they're missing the strategy. So that's strategy driven. And I spend a good portion of my life teaching people that. But then the second part is what creates lasting fulfillment. And lasting fulfillment, as you said, I always say progress equals happiness. If we're not making progress, we're not happy. But it doesn't require progress every moment and noticing it either. That's another catch-all. That's my lifestyle and your lifestyle, right? Our lifestyle is the formula that you described. But the really ultimate formula besides progress is appreciation because you can make progress and then always have to make progress each moment to be happy. So we do need to grow. What you said is true fundamentally. Everything in the world grows or dies. Everything in the universe contributes or it's eventually eliminated uh, you know, by nature. So those aren't my laws. Those are the laws of nature. However, happiness only requires that you are grateful. If you've got a billion dollars and three beautiful children that love you and a beautiful husband or wife, but it doesn't matter what you have if you're not grateful, if you live in an emotional home, habitual pace of worry or frustration, your life's called worry and frustration. So it's you can be making progress and still be worried and frustrated. So it isn't quite just what you said. You have to also develop a new decision that says, I'm going to live a different life. I, I have a, a vision for my life spiritually. And that vision spiritually is I'm going to live in a beautiful state no matter what. That doesn't mean I'm never going to get upset or frustrated or pissed off. It just means I got a 90 second rule that I'm going to get out of that as fast as possible and solve it from a beautiful place so that I'm adding value to the people around me and myself. So my own biochemistry gets the benefit of that. And so that doesn't mean that you're always making progress. I love progress. I think progress equals happiness, but it isn't the only secret to that. It's really, can you train your brain to appreciate? Because in the middle of whatever you're pissed off about or frustrated or fearful about or worried about, 
you're deleting all the things you could be grateful for, you could appreciate that are absolutely real. And that's the problem with the mind. You know, I want your listeners or viewers to really think about this. You do not experience life. You experience the life you focus on. That's it. If you focus on what's wrong, what's wrong is always available. So is what's right. And so our focus produces our meanings and emotions, which produce the actions of our life. So it really starts with the patterns of your focus. Do you tend to focus on what you have or what's missing? Most achievers that are looking to make progress, I've dealt with millions of them over the years, as you well know, I'm one, you're one, right? Most achievers, that progress thing is really important. They're like, oh, we've got to have the next thing. And well, that's really wonderful, but it's only one way of doing things. And so it's like saying to yourself, wait a second, I'm going to, regardless of there's progress or not, I'm going to find the good in this. I'm going to find the great in this. And what that does is it produces a different fuel to live your life from. And from that fuel, it's easy to make progress. You know, I used to tell myself, I got really pissed off. My brain gets really sharp and fast and figures the answers. Well, that's true. But when I'm really in a great state, my brain is fast and quick and I enjoy it and people around me enjoy it. So it's also deciding how you're going to be, not just what you're going to do. And I think the combination of those is where the quality of life that people are really looking for shows up. The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I want to take you through that will 100x your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. What if people understand that? They live that way for months, year plus, whatever, something happens and they slide back. I get asked that a lot. I, you know, I'm sliding back, I get stuck, I keep returning here. Is there an insight that they're missing, a key emotion, a value? What, what is it that they need to address to make sure that they don't backslide constantly? Well, uh, I'll give you a formula. If you want to know what makes people happy at the most basic level, when your life conditions match your blueprint, when your life conditions are what you're expecting, not your ultimate dream, but when you meet your basic expectations, you're happy. If your life conditions are better than you expected, you're over the moon. If your life conditions don't match your blueprint, your expectations, you have pain. If your life conditions don't match your blueprint and you believe I'm unable to change it, it's something wrong with me or it's a permanent problem or it's pervasive or it's personal, you know, you get into learned helplessness, then you're gonna suffer. And so nothing is permanent, not even the body is permanent. Certainly no problem is permanent. Your soul might be the only thing that might be permanent, right? So it's really helping people to understand that when the life conditions change, your blueprint has to change with it. Either like, if you're not happy, you either have to change your life or change your blueprint, your expectations. Usually it requires a combination of those two. So often what you say people is sliding is, their life conditions changed, and then what they were doing wasn't enough to make them feel the way they wanted to feel. And so then they adapted to an old style of coping. They went back to smoking or drinking or eating or yelling at people or whatever the pattern may be. But that's because they didn't continue to grow. And so that's why it's not a static thing with me. I teach people not just, okay, you're going to make these changes in your values. It's like, you got to look as your life conditions change. You're going to make that happen. As you hit different stages of life, you're going to have to make those decisions. And people don't, everybody wants their life to be better, but no one wants to change, right? So we have to keep changing as the life conditions change. We got to update our blueprint, our values, our beliefs, our rules about how to play the game. And we have to update our behaviors to adapt to where the environment is. If you don't do that, you're in trouble. There are many people during COVID who it was the most horrific experience. There are many people that learned to use COVID, not let COVID use them. They grew their businesses. They expanded their mind. They shifted their emotions. They did things they never would have done. Other people gain 20 pounds, right? So it's all a matter of do you adapt to the life conditions and do you learn how to learn? Because this isn't a one-time thing. Oh, I did this thing. I went and worked out for a weekend. Now I'm pumped. Well, great. How long is that going to last? You're going to have to continue to use that and have a daily practice. Otherwise, you, of course, go back. And that's the biggest missing thing. I teach people daily practices that can take what they've learned and make it ongoing in their life as opposed to, wow, I had this great weekend. If you look at a person's life, most people major in minor things. Jim Rohn, my teacher, used to say that to me all the time, meaning they know about all kinds of things that don't matter. 
But there's maybe a half dozen things that matter most. There's your body, there's your emotions, there's your relationships, there's your finances, there's your career or your sense of mission or your business. And then there's the spiritual side of life. And so I've always taught on all those areas, but in 2008, when all hell broke loose the first time, um, you know, I've worked with Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 financial traders for now 25 years, 26 years. And so I, I knew a little bit in this area. Most people don't know. I know the details of- You know a lot, levels. man. Hear, hearing you talk about finance, you are freakishly knowledgeable. I've seen you on stage with people that make a living doing it. And not only do you keep up, in many ways, I think they're listening to you as closely as you're listening to them at this point. How do you learn that stuff that deeply? Well, you know, I go for total immersion. It's like if you learn language a little bit at a time, you know, two, three years from now, you don't speak the language. But if I dumped you into Rome and said, you're not leaving for eight weeks and there's no teacher, you're going to be speaking Italian before you leave there. So I'm a big believer in total immersion, but I also believe in modeling the best on earth. So in Money Master the Game, fortunately, I have access. So it's like, I'm going to interview 50 of the smartest financial people on earth and everybody who's made it from nothing to multi-billionaire. And they all did it different ways. And I'm good at pattern recognition and I'm good at pattern utilization. In fact, I would say to your audience, you know, in 2040, which sounds like a long way from now, 18 years ago like that, you, your mind will be blown. Half the jobs we have today, according to Oxford and a variety of other universities are gonna be gone. They're replaced mm -hmm. by robotics, by algorithms, you know the game. And so the bottom line is you need to be good at pattern recognition and that's what gets somebody strong at anything. I mean, you look at, you know, why is Amazon doing so well? You realize one pattern was valued over anything else, convenience, right? If you look at Tom Brady, a friend of mine, he, he's got pattern recognition like nobody else at 43 years old. He's able to do things no one dreamed could be done. He's got more Super Bowl rings than any team. So I said, I wanna go to the best people on earth and see what do they see that none of us see? What's the pattern? Then you gotta learn pattern utilization. It's one thing to see it, it's another thing to use it. And then if you're good after a while, you get to pattern creation. It's like if you learn to play the piano, most people play other people's music. And then there's a point you've learned so much that you're able to create. And I think those three skills are the most important skills. So I look at the areas that matter most and say, who already has that extraordinary pattern recognition utilization? So I go to Ray Dalio, who's you know, returned more money to investors than anyone alive. You know, he's gonna have a different level of understanding than the average person. And because I immerse myself so much, most of these interviews are supposed to be 30 minutes and the average one was three and a half hours. And so, but like Ray Dalio is now a dear friend of mine. I can pitch and catch with him because I came so overprepared and because I could, again, not just catch the ball he threw, but pitch it back. And so to me, that's what I did. I did for Total Immersion, it was a three and a half year project. And then expanded, I wrote, you know, uh, Unshakable after that because I saw what was gonna happen in the markets and I wanted people prepared. And that's why I'm doing Life Force right now. Life Force was driven because I've always taught health elements. You and I both are both kind of biohackers in our lives. I have to be, you know, my average seminar is 12 or 13 hours a day. I go four days minimum. Over the last few years, I've had all these groups that measure Olympic athletes and professional athletes measure me. And to give you an idea, I burned 11,300 calories in one day on stage. No oh. one believed it. I didn't believe it either, but I do. I burned 4,000 before I get on stage. Chess masters burn 4,000 without moving. So that's basically what happens. But I also, to give you an idea, I push my body, you know, lactic acid. If you're running with a friend and you get where you can't speak anymore, you're at a four of lactate. I'm at an 18 of lactate and still speaking. They, they just couldn't believe it. I have 15 pounds more of lean body mass than the average lineman does in the NFL. So <laughs> the demands, I jump a thousand times in a day on average, is what they measured. I weigh 282 pounds. So they're explaining to me every time I come down, it's four times your body weight. So a thousand times a thousand is a million pounds of pressure per day. And I've been doing that for 45 years. So if you saw my bone density, they showed it in a graph and they go, these are humans, these are the greatest Olympic athletes, this is something we never measured before. It's 99.999% stronger than anything they've measured of any human. So those demands are huge, but then, you know, I'm still not infallible. So I go snowboarding and I'm chasing a 22 year old, which the age is as much as the skill, a lot more skill than I had. And oh my God, I had an accident. I tore my rotator cuff so bad, nine, nine pain, wouldn't go away. Went to all the doctors, he needs surgery. What's the recovery time? Four to, you know, four months to six months. I'm like, I have friends who still can't bring their shoulder down. Mm -hmm. And I've had other ones re-injure it. And so I went and looked around and what started me really on this is, 
I said, okay, what are my other options? What about stem cells? I, I met Dr. Bob Harari. He's kind of like the one of the founders of stem cells. I know He's him the well. Guy did those, oh, you know Bob. He did yeah, those yeah. original studies where they took old rats and gave them young rats blood. We've all heard about it now and vice versa. And the old rats got young and young rats got old. Kind of vampire stuff. But as a result, <laughs> they discovered stem cells and what they could do. And Bob said, Tony, you won't get them here. Go to this place in Panama. You'll get four-day-old stem cells that are from the cord. They're not obviously fetal cells in any way. I wouldn't do that. And I went down and the first day, I felt okay. The second day, I felt really tired. The third day, I woke up. Not only was my shoulder perfect, and I mean perfect in three days. I could do anything with it. I've never had anything. I've had the MRI. But I had had spinal stenosis for about 14 years. And I woke up for the first time in my life without back pain. I want to know everything about breakthroughs in medicine. I want to know precision medicine. I want to know regenerative medicine. And then I was invited by the Pope to come speak. Believe it or not, the Pope has the biggest stem cell conference in the world. He does it every two years. And I got invited to be the cleanup speaker in a four day program. And I was like, I'm not just going to do cleanup speaker. I'm going to go attend the whole thing. And I met docs doing things that you would think are going to happen 20 or 30 years in the future. Sounds like total future stuff that's happening either right now or in the next 24 to 36 months. So I've spent the last three years interviewing 165 different oh. doctors, Bob Har and Nobel Prize winners. Bob Harari co-wrote the book with me along with Peter Diamandis, both are MDs. Peter's a rocket scientist as well. And so together we put this book together so that I could do the same thing, bring people the very best of what to do now. What are your alternatives? What are your choices? What's proven? What's not yet, but what's coming? And I'm real excited about it. It's a book, I really wrote it not only for the person who's reading it, but I don't know about you, every day of my life, at this stage of my life, I have a lot of friends and a lot of people I know, I get a call from somebody who's got, you know, they've had a stroke or somebody's got cancer and it's terminal supposedly. And, you know, I've seen them turn around again and again, or somebody's in a position where, you know, they've got a parent who's got Alzheimer's and they don't know what to do. And so I put in one book, the greatest answers from the greatest scientists on earth of what's available right now, as well as what's coming in the short term, mm -hmm. not the long term, who knows the long term, long term of all kinds of pieces, but I'm excited to bring it to people. When it comes out on February 8th, people can pre-order it. It's called, it's called Life Force. This is it right here. There it is, it baby. Yeah, please. That'd be amazing. I am uh, beyond fascinated by the cutting edge of medical science. And so I'm, so I know uh, both Bob and Peter Diamandis uh, and have had some of the talks around stem cells, but I'm really curious as you've gone, you know, well beyond just those guys, what, what is the most exciting thing coming at the cutting edge of medicine? Is it stem cells? Is it something else? No, it's, it's understanding that the aging process is the breakdown of communication between the cells. Dr. David Sinclair from Harvard is probably the number one expert in the world. There's something called Yamanaka factors, which is a way of turning on the body's original systems. You know, we all know that we have, as time goes by, you know, you have, a, uh, most people are familiar with their DNA, but of course DNA or your genome, that is not your destiny. What matters is the system that runs that. And so if you're, the epigenome is what's that called if people aren't familiar with it. And the epigenome gets messed up, meaning as time, radiation, bad food, bad lifestyle, it irritates and all of a sudden the communication is not so clear, but there are ways of restoring it. So they restored three out of four of these Yamanaka factors just recently at Harvard University, and they took mice that are blind. Now they had glaucoma, so the nerves are gone. And they reversed the aging and they can see again. It's the first time in history. So the nerves Doing actually regrew? Regrew. Gene, there's gene therapies right now of people that are being able to see again for the very first time. I mean, there's, there's something called the WINT pathway, you may have heard of, WNT pathway. Mm -hmm. I heard about this for the first time three and a half years ago when I was at the Vatican. This man walks out, and you know, I'm sitting beside Sanjay Gupta, who's a you know, pretty informed guy, a really great guy, and Dr. Oz, they're both good friends of mine. And he's a research and he's really quiet. There's no hype. And then he starts to describe how they you know, figured out the code of the WINT pathway. And the WINT pathway, after you're born, in the first seven to 10 days, if you cut off a child's finger and you don't sew it back up, it'll regrow just like a salamander's tail. But then after that time, we don't have fetal tissue anymore. Everything else you call you is coming from this wind signaling pathway. It tells the stem cells, make this many brain stem cells, heart stem cells, et cetera. And for 30 years, pharmaceutical companies have been trying to figure out the breakthrough. This particular company has figured out breakthroughs. Now they're in phase, I'm sure, you know, phase one is safety at the FDA, phase two is efficacy, and phase three is efficacy at scale, and then you get approved. So they're, they're at the end of phase two, about to begin phase three. They think, they hope by the end of this year, they'll be done. 
But in the preliminary information, here's one of their treatments, one injection, single injection. And if you have osteoarthritis, over the next 10 to 12 months, you regrow all your tendons brand new from stem cells. And it's from a new epigenome, you know, like when they made Dolly, you know, the, the, when they duplicated, you know, a, a sheep, sheep way back yep. when, right? Well, how did this old sheep create a brand new sheep without all those problems? Because the epigenome gets reset. So they figured out how to make that happen through your Wnt pathway. And it has all kinds of impact. There's eight different cancers that they're working on treatments for. There are things that'll just blow your mind. So I couldn't give you one thing. There's spray on stem cells like, you know, and most people don't know it, but if a fireman or, or a policeman or someone falls into a fire and you burn your face off, we've all seen people who are scarred for life. The standard treatment is to put cadaver skin on there for you to try to be, keep you alive and make things go. They now have in seven hospitals in the United States where they can take your stem cells and spray them on your face. And I have them in the book. The pictures will blow your mind. From grotesque to you could barely tell anything happened in a period of three weeks. Jesus. I mean, it is mind boggling. So there are things that can increase your energy. Right now, there is a study being done. Uh, you probably are familiar with the fact, as I started to say, that your breakdown happens in the epigenome, but also the energy centers of your body start to get weaker over time. And there are now new discoveries of how to stimulate the body so that that epigenome cleans itself off, like gets rid of the static, makes it clean again. In other words, does repair while simultaneously firing off the furnaces of energy in your body. And one of the studies, there have been a lot of animal studies, obviously, and they don't always translate. So you have to be careful about animal studies. They're, they're intriguing, but we don't know for sure until you do with humans. And in the animal studies, you know, an old rat, which I forget how many months it is, but let's call it a 60 year old rat would be the equivalent for a human. It can run like a quarter of a kilometer on one of those tracks. A young rat can run a full kilometer. The ones that they test here that are older can run three to four kilometers once they've had this for literally 20 days. But what's really cool is it wasn't supposed to be released, but it's in the book. There's a group uh, uh, from the special forces that was done in Boston. They just finished the first study year long and they're seeing similar results with human beings. So we'll know more, but they're not going for this as a nutraceutical. This is going for actually a drug, which should be easier as a nutraceutical, but most of those nutraceuticals don't last. They're not, they don't hold up. This one they believe will. So for energy, for vitality, for your mind, I mean, there's, it's more than you can imagine. It's 700 pages that give you an idea. Like you said, I write tall. Yeah, these, yeah, these are getting longer and longer here, Tony, uh, <laughs> which is amazing, by the way. And the way that you're approaching it, going after the experts, and also that this is stuff that you're already immersed in, you know, the fact that you're taking your own injury and turning that into something. And a few years ago, and, and maybe I was worrying for nothing, but I, um, I was worried about your voice. And yes. it seems like you've made progress there. Um, yeah. Are what are you doing yourself with all of this stuff? Is are you doing regular stem cell treatments? Are they general, or do you get like injections specifically into the shoulder, into the vocal cords? Like, how does this work? No, my my shoulder is perfect. I don't have to do anything new as far as that's concerned. But I do uh, stem cell treatments. To, I, I'm you know I'm testing things out all the time. There's a new form of them called V cells, and it's very small embryonic like stem cells. They're a discovery that only came out about 13 years ago. Is this an IV drip? Like how are we getting them in the system? Yes, this would be an IV drip in this case. They can also do injections along the edge of your spine or something of that nature. But what I'm interested in this one is. Uh, you probably know some of the tests now, like true age, that can say, okay, chronologically, I'm 61 years old, but biologically, I'm only 51, right? Uh, in Dr. Sinclair's example, he's, fifth, uh, he's 53, but his biology is 33. Yeah, he looks idea. young as hell. It's crazy. He really does. And his dad, who's in his 80s, who was falling, you know, falling apart now, goes jogging and running and everything else, so he you know, like gives it to his dog. So I'm pretty, I'm tied to the hip just like did on the financial side to these guys I learned from so that I'm on the cutting edge and I'm utilizing those tools wherever I can. But, you know, I have to keep this body in unbelievable shape because of the demands that I make. And when, you know, when we went through the COVID thing, we're all of a sudden overnight. Imagine when what you do for a living is 15 to 30,000 people in a stadium and suddenly everywhere on earth they go, you can have 10 people or five or none. I mean, literally overnight, they canceled everything. And so it's like, people need me. How am I going to help them? And I went to watch somebody do a little webinar with like 252-inch screens. And I was like, I'll kill myself first. I mean, I, <laughs> you've been in my events. It's got to be an experience. It's got to take you. It's got to have the rock and roll emotion and feeling. 
And so I sat down with my buddies and, and my team and I put on a tape recorder and I said, here's what I'm gonna do. But first I said, we're going to Vegas. They'll never shut down Vegas. Of course they did. Then I went, okay, you know, I'll do this in 1500 movie theaters with 10 people each around the country by satellite. And they shut down the movie theaters. So I finally was like, okay, I got to reach people in their homes, but make it as dynamic as if they were there in person. So I was like, okay, we're going to build, I'm going to find a building with 40 foot high ceilings. I'm going to do 20 foot high LED screens, 0.67, highest resolution in the world, 50 feet wide, 180 degrees around me. I'm going to call Eric Yon at Zoom and say, I need to upgrade what you're doing with Zoom so I can interact with people on a larger scale, not just, you know, 1,000 or 5,000, but 100,000. I want to build a software so that people can shake it and it sends a signal. So the clapping's authentic. It gets louder as people do it, whatever the case may be. And did the whole thing, brought seven companies together and said, we got to build this. And they said, this is a big project. Maybe in nine months, I said, no, you got nine weeks, went through, got rid of a lot of the people and we pulled it off. And so I've seen more people this year and last year in these events because I have people from 195 countries, every country in the world participating in every time zone too. If you can imagine, I'm starting at 10 a.m. in Florida and it's midnight in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. And these people are going from midnight till mm -hmm. one of the afternoon the next day, four or five days in a row and staying completely engaged and saying they have the time of their life. So we kind of cracked the code. Now I do both. I did a hybrid event the other day, Date with Destiny. I lifted the front wall. That's why I picked a building with 40 foot high ceilings. I could see people in 97 countries and right in front of me, I have another thousand people. So we're, we're in reinventing what does it take so we can help people where they live. Yeah, I want to zoom in on the moment where they say maybe in nine months, but even that is probably going to be tough. And you're like, no, 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 we have to go to nine weeks. That That is the thing that uh, is the difference between people that struggle in life and people that can do extraordinary things. So one, there's two parts to this. I really want to get both. One, okay. where do you get the chutzpah to believe that you can pull that off? And then two, from an execution standpoint, how do you actually pull it off? Because it you hinted at the people that don't believe have to go. And so walk me through that on, on both of those points, if you don't mind. Well, I'm happy to, but you're an example of this yourself and I'm not blowing smoke. That's how you built a billion dollar company. You and I are philosophically aligned, obviously known each other for years. And where did I get the chutzpah from? It's not my chutzpah, it's, it needs to be done. It's like, I, I'm mission driven. If you're, if you're just doing something for yourself, I don't, I don't need to work another day of my life. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I can sit home and have a good time, but you know, I got a mission. So it's like, people need us right now. They don't need us nine months from now. And then it's a matter of finding, like you said, other people that are super skilled and are mission driven also that bought into the mission of helping people, not just we're gonna build a studio. That we're gonna, we're gonna create an environment where people all over the earth can become together as friends and family, we're going to see them in their homes. There's going to be advantages that we don't have in a live event. I can see their children. I can see their husband or wife. I can see how they live and where they are. And so, you know, I would say out of all the companies we started with, we ended up with probably half of them still working on the project. And we brought in new people. And it's your willingness also to call it straight. Like when somebody doesn't own it, you, you got to call it tight and you got to move on. Now, otherwise, you're going to have a few weak people or weak organizations or weak structures that'll destroy the rest of your mission. And so you're so you, you've loving, got to be Tony. willing to do that. Yeah, how do you specifically, Tony Robbins, who loves people, is very kind. You obviously are also good at no bullshit, but in that moment, are you just like, look, you, you don't make the cut, you got to go? Or do you have like a specific speech? I've seen you do really hard things in your live events, but like, yeah. What, what are you thinking in that moment? Because it'll, it'll be hard on their business and it's going to be emotionally difficult for them. How do you navigate those moments? I don't take somebody out who still has enough drive and desire and hunger. Um, then it's just a matter of coaching them on skills or finding a solution together. But when I find somebody who no longer believes or is no longer certain, if you're on a team with me and we're, you know, <laughs> we're the Golden State Warriors or let's say the old days, you know, with Michael Jordan, you know, the weakest link is going to keep us from the mission. So I have to value the mission more than this individual. They can become a client of mine. I invite them to go to my seminars, help them do whatever it is, but I got to move on now because there's just no way we could have done. Everybody around us said this is impossible, but I found a few people that thought their part wasn't impossible. And then, you know, put them all together with a higher mission. I mean, just like, for example, Date With Destiny, lifting these walls sounds like a simple thing, but they weigh, God only knows how many thousands of pounds. And 
the, you know, COVID, you know, you've got all the problems of the breakdown of being able to access something overseas. So I sent planes, I had people overseas. We're getting things. We did it all in less than a week to be able to actually lift those. And then I told my platinum partners, which is my audience, I said, listen, it's a backstage pass. You're not gonna see me, you're gonna see me on screens. And when people are a giant event on this size, they watch me on screens anyway, but you'll be together. And then we surprised them and it was like, the music came up to a THX type sound, you lift it up and they were just out of their mind, you know? So it's also about creating experiences, creating moments for people that they won't forget. So you recently did a study with Stanford University that shows that your Date with Destiny program is more effective at impacting positively depression than traditional um, medications and things like that. Why is it so effective? What tactics are you giving people that is so transformative? I think it's 50% higher uh, positive emotion and 70% less negative emotion which is pretty insane. It's, it's actually even better than that. I got approached by Stanford during COVID because, you know, I adapted. I wanted to try and help people. And all of a sudden, you know, 15,000 person stadiums, they wouldn't let you have 10 p 100 people in the stadium, which is ridiculous. And so I eventually created this giant uh, 20 foot high, 50 feet wide, 25,000 square foot studio. And we started delivering to people all over the world. And so they had some people go through Date With Destiny, two of which I think were clinically depressed. And they came back with none of the symptoms. And they said, you know, what? This is unbelievable. This is six days. What data do you have on this? And I said, well, you know, I got zillions and zillions of you know testimonials and stories, but no one's ever studied it. So they said, listen, we think this could be incredible. And they explained to me that right now, if you go across the meta studies on depression, which is out of control since COVID, obviously, it's not COVID as much as it was the shutdowns and the fear. And then now the fear of people, you know, a lot of people are afraid we're going to all die within 12 years, which of course is not true in terms of the environment. But all of this fear has put people in a place where there's no compelling future. And that's one of the things that we all need. We can all deal with a difficult today if we have a compelling tomorrow. But anyway, they decided, they said, look, you know, right now the meta studies show that across all the treatments, both a combination of therapy and drugs, the only about 40% of the people get better. And of that 40%, 60% don't get better. Uh, the average improvement is 50%. So they're half as depressed as they were. Some people 100% cure, very few though, unfortunately. And they, I said, well, that's not much better than, you know, a placebo. And they said, we agree. And now I don't know if you've seen the cover of Newsweek talked about SSRIs, you know, they do not uh, change with depression. And we're still giving people these drugs. It's crazy because they don't have an alternative. So they came in and they put a group together. And the most successful thing they've ever done was done by Johns Hopkins two years ago, where they gave people a month of psilocybin and cognitive therapy. And of course, psilocybin is not a legal drug. But the bottom line was the results were unbelievable. 53% of the people uh, a month later had no symptoms of depression. Nothing like it in the history of psychiatry or psych psychological approaches. Uh, when they did our test, the numbers were so radical, they sent them out blind to two other organizations to be absolutely certain it was accurate. 100% of the people, not one person out of the group, still had depression 30 days later, and 19% of people had suicidal ideation, none had suicidal ideation. So this date with destiny I just completed, they did a study for 754 people, it'll be the largest landmark study of, uh, ever done, but they really want to just show people what can really be done. And the answer to your question is, you know, the way you experience life, you don't experience life. You experience the life you focus on. And what you focus on is based on beliefs and values. Whatever you believe, you tend to see that. You know, if I said to your audience right now, close your eyes, um, before, before I close your eyes, look around the room and see everything that's brown, everything behind you, around you, clothing, anything on the walls, books, anything. And then say, close your eyes and tell me everything you saw that was red. People usually smile. They say a lot more brown than red. And I open their eyes and look for red. And guess what? They find plenty of red. Well, you get what you look for. So our beliefs, our values, our rules that determine whether we experience heaven or hell inside, they're all internal. So it's like we can't control the external world. We can influence it. We have total control of this internal world, but most of us don't know how. So over those six days, people change their beliefs. I don't tell them what to believe. They discover what's limiting them. They shift their values to what's more consistent with where they are. And instead of being pulled apart, like, you know, I want to make you know everybody happy and be honest simultaneously. I want to make a billion dollars and sleep till noon. Those create inner conflict. <laughs> we help people resolve the inner conflicts, create a compelling future and be in control of their own life. And you're right. A year later, they found 71% reduction in negative emotions, 52% uh, uh, improvement in, in positive emotions a year after doing this. So the long impact of this is what they're most impressed by. 
Talk to me about what causes depression, because I know I talk a lot about um, in my own work when people ask, you know, hey, I'm really struggling. What should I do? I actually would tell people cognitive behavioral therapy. If it's really stuck, then look at some of the research on psilocybin, which that's me grappling with, like, what is that really deep neurochemical entrenched pathways that people can get into with depression? And I've always been hesitant to to cheapen the cause of depression by saying, oh, you just have to think better, have better beliefs, all that. But when I saw the results of the Date with Destiny research, it made me think maybe I'm making the problem harder than it really is. Is it is it really that the the entrenched depression is just the way that people think? Or is there something so real to trauma that it's sending you into a neurochemical cascade that you can't get out of in any simple way? Well, rather than me answer that question, the head of the NIDHD, or however they pronounce it, uh, you know, for 22 years, I don't have it in front of me here. I wish I had and give you the exact quote. Maybe I can give it to you. You can post it afterwards if you'd like. But he said, you know, in 22 years, uh, I spent whatever it was, $20 billion, did some of the most interesting studies in the world, and we didn't move, uh, you know, one person out of depression. The bottom line is, Biochemistry is part of it, but it is related to what we focus on and what we feel. I can change your biochemistry in a heartbeat, close your eyes and have you imagine one thing, I can disrupt you, put, produce fear, close your eyes, produce something else. We can produce a parasympathetic effect, a calming effect. So you cannot separate the mind and the body They're together. And so my approach is both. I think you know from going to events, I believe in physiology first, but it isn't just biochemical. It's the way you move, it's the way you breathe, it's the way you gesture. If I said to you, there's a depressed person behind curtain number one over here and I'll give you a $100,000 donation to your favorite charity if you can describe their posture, Everyone knows what's their posture like. Where, where's their head? Down. Down. Where's the shoulders? Slouch. Are they breathing full or shallow? Shallow. That's right. Are they talking loud or quiet? Soft. Fast or slow? Slow. How do you know? Because we've all practiced this shit at some point and been depressed, right? But if you take that same person, I don't care what's going on with them, and you put their shoulders back, I know this sounds absurd, and you have them breathe different, and they speak at a different tempo, and they move, their biochemistry changes like that. So you got to shift the way the body's being used, but then also you have to create a compelling future. This is the way I look at it. I look at it as five to thrive. Let me give you a little picture in your head. Think of a triangle, the first base of three things. The base of how you use your body affects your depression or your excitement. If someone's depressed or they're excited, they use the body differently. They breathe differently. They move differently. They speak differently. So you can make a biochemical change just by changing the body radically enough in the way you move. Second is what you focus on determines what you feel. So if you're supposed to meet your husband or wife at 7 p.m. for dinner and you get there and they're not there, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, what do you feel? Well, some people go, I'm angry. Some people go, I'm worried. Well, it's only seven, you know? Well, let's say it's 7.30 and they've not shown up. They've not called. They've not text. Well, now some people go, I'm really worried. I'm really pissed off. You know, it's 8.30 they haven't called. You know, I'm full, a woman tells me, right? I didn't wait for the bastard. But my point is, whether you're angry or whether you're worried, those are biochemical effects, but they're all based on what you focused on. If you were really angry, like they did it again, you know, they're probably screwing around with somebody else. If you imagine that in your mind, you're going to be upset. But if you're worried, you thought, what if they're in a car accident? And you're going to get a very different biochemical effect. But people have habits of what they focus on. And those habits become your biochemical habits as well. And so they reinforce each other. It's not a one way street. So that's why, you know, I really believe exercise is one of the most important elements, pushing someone beyond their normal comfort zones physiologically while you're simultaneously are working on their head, creating something. So you need strong physiology, you need a really clear focus because you're only experiencing what you focus on. The human brain is a distortion, deletion, and generalization device. Your conscious mind can only handle so many things at once. You're not thinking about your clothing touching your skin or the, you know, the sound of your heartbeat till I mention it, or let's say the, you know, the sound of the, in your ear of being able to hear that heartbeat. All those things I have to call your attention to because your brain is deleting most of what's going on. So it's not overwhelmed consciously. So we pay attention to a small amount of things. So if you're really happy, you're deleting all the things that could piss you off or make you worried. If you're really worried, you're deleting all the things you could be grateful or happy about. So, and we tend to generalize our lives because we're cognitive misers. We don't want to think things through. So if you have strong physiology, strong focus, then the third piece is meaning is what creates emotion. Like if somebody says something and you go, they're disrespecting me, 
or they're challenging me or they're coaching me or they're loving me. Well, whichever word you select for those sensations in your body, your biochemistry becomes. And so, you know, somebody might say, oh, you know, this happened to me because God's punishing me or this happened to me because God's challenging me or this problem's here because it's a gift from God or someone else says it has nothing to do with God. It's the fact that I've been a lazy bastard, right? Whatever it is you do in your head, there is a biochemical effect. So there's the body, there's the focus, and there's language. Those three shape how you feel moment to moment. If you're excited right now, using your body, your focus, and your language in a different way than if you're pissed off, than if you're worried, et cetera. But then what makes you use these three once you understand them is you need what's called a compelling future. You need something that gets you to move forward. And like, I feel so bad for the generation today, you know, Z generation millennials, because so many of them are now talking about not even having children because of the exaggeration of the problems. We've always had problems. I remember we were going to run out of oil that where the, the ozone was going to be destroyed in the 1970s, the cover of Time magazine. We've always had these challenges and we've always learned to adapt to these challenges, whatever those challenges may be. But people today think these problems are forever because we've had some times here that we've never had where we literally shut down the whole world and had people trapped in their homes. And that has an effect on people because they don't have a compelling future. So you have to develop a compelling future. And what allows you to do that finally is what's under this triangle, if there's a circle, think of a compelling future and there's the power of identity. Identity is who are you beyond the problem? There's something inside you that's bigger than anything that's ever happened to you, that ever could happen to you. And tapping in and finding that part of yourself is how you get someone to have sustained strength. So they have a reason to do it, a compelling future, something they're going for. And it's got to be a compelling future about more than just getting by. That's not compelling or surviving or doing okay. You know, the secret to anyone who succeeded is they found something they care about more than themselves. Something that has meaning for them that they want to serve more than themselves. Because as human beings, if you get in your head, you're dead. Almost all of us can find something to be upset about. That's the nature of the mind. The mind is constantly dissecting things, separating, comparing. But when you look at back and you take a look at somebody's life and you look at the totalitary aspect of what am I here to serve? What am I here to give? What am I being called to for life? Those are the people that, you know, were in concentration camps and survived. You know, if you read Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, one of my favorite people on earth, right? This entire piece was they had a will to live because they had a compelling future. They said, I'm going to live so that I can tell this story so it'll never happen again. They suffered the most intense suffering, but they made it through it because they had a compelling future. So identity and compelling future are the ultimate things that shape people. And so what I do is I really help people discover those things. And I do it through immersion because a little step at a time is like trying to learn a foreign language. You know, most people took a language in high school and college and they can't speak it. But, you know, if I said, I want to learn Italian and you have the money and time and I dumped you in Rome and said, I'll see you in 90 days, 90 days from now with no teacher, you'll speak fluently because you're in it, speaking it, breathing it. That's how we learn best. Not one word at a time or it's uh, cat. It's cat, 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 it's <laughs> it cat, right? So I see that with my daughter. So the same things with humans. So I do total immersion training and I, and I and I've learned over the years that people want a great education, but they want to be entertained first. We're we're no longer an information society because information there's too much, right? We're drowning in information. We're starving for wisdom. So what I've learned how to do is how to capture people's attention who wouldn't sit for a three hour movie for 10, 11, 12 hours a day. Now, even at a distance, you know, because we have to do all these programs now live and in person. But we also do hybrid where people all over the world are participating. And we're doing 12 hours a day and they're out of their mind, entertained, emotion, juice, everything they want. They're getting the best education. And while they're doing it, while they're there, I have them do the things that produce the change. So when they leave, they've already made change. They already have momentum. And that kind of e-cubing is what I call it, entertain them, educate them, and empower them. That process I've kind of refined over the last 45 years. This is my, I'm about to end my 46 year doing this. I started when I was three, of course. Right, standard. That's what I would have guessed, yeah. So, all right, talk to, there are people in my life that I love very much that I have repeated you back to them a thousand times and they still don't make that change. Yes. How do you, I actually heard you at one point say, look, effectively, I'm a filtering mechanism. I'm not worried about the people that aren't prepared to make that change. I wanna find the people who are and give them the tools that they need. Is that, have I understood that correctly? Do you just sort of, accept that some people are never going to do it or is it just immersion or whatever that is missing and you could get even those people to make a dramatic change yeah if you can get them inside 
It's the latter, right? No, the only thing I'm saying is I don't go running around, you know, imposing my view on everyone, right? Uh, when I was in my 20s, I'd be pull, I'd go to Denny's in the middle of the night to try to help somebody. I mean, these true stories. And I'd see some poor guy at the counter go, hey, listen, I got these tools. I can help you. I mean, that's how crazy I was. So I think you're probably referring to that. Like, no, if people raise their hand, I'm here. But I, but people drag people all the time or pull people who don't want to be there. And, you know, and they're going to be there for 12 hours in a day. And I address it right away. But usually within 20 or 30 minutes, people are so engaged that they're, they can't even believe it. They're enjoying it. It's not what they think. They think it's going to be, I don't know what they think. It's going to be sitting in a room, someone just talking at you. And that's not what this is. This is an experience. But yes, they need to have experiences. A belief is a poor substitute for an experience. So you can tell somebody something and they can nod their head and cognitively understand it. That's very different than the visceral experience of getting it in your body where it starts happening automatically. And just think of the learning process or even mastering. You know, you're you're a person like myself. We're always looking to master different things. How do you master things? Well, first, first step is cognitive understanding, right? You understand how it works and that and $4 will get you a Starbucks, right? Because, you know, understanding doesn't do anything, but you have to get for, as a first step. And most people go, oh, I already know this. I know this because they understand it. If you're not doing it, <laughs> you don't own it. You don't experience it. So the second step is enough repetition of what you understand with enough emotion. And we produce emotion using music and movement and everything else and asking questions and having people remember and closed eye processes. Because, you know, if I asked you, where were you on 9-11, almost everyone on earth can tell you, even if they're not American, where they were when they first heard about the towers coming down, who was around them, what they saw. But if I asked you, where were you on 8-11, no one can tell you unless they had something really special happen that day, because information without emotion is barely retained. So when you're telling your friends, that's not going to do squat. They're going to nod their head, even if they understand and go, that's interesting. There isn't in the emotional shift because people only change in an altered state. You know, most people, you know, think, uh, you know, hypnosis is something that people do to them. Most people are living in a hypnotized state. You know, if you watch somebody, you were driving your car and then something catches your attention, and you kind of focus on it for a while. And then all of a sudden you go, holy shit, who's been driving this car <laughs> for the last few minutes, right? Well, you were in a trance or you go to a, you know, to a hotel and somebody pushes the elevator and it's already lit up and they push the button. If I could get five bucks for every time this happened, right? They're just in a trance. They're just going through the automatic motions. For most people, about 48% of what they do, science says, every day is automated. So they're not really thinking clearly. They're not open to what's really possible. So we're doing is we break that up by doing something with such immersion. And so then the third step is you do it physically and then it gets in your body. So then it's like confidence is tying your shoes. Like, you know, I can get up and do 12, 15,000, 50,000. You know, these days we got a million people that did my last five day seminar, 1 million people, over a million people. Whoa. So it's like, it's like the size of the audience gets larger and larger and larger. And I've developed stronger and stronger skills to do it, but it's also getting it into people's bodies because like tying your shoes, you've done it so many times, you don't have to think about it. It happens. Well, I've done so many versions of things for 45 years that, you know, it's like when I go to have, you know, a challenge somebody's facing, I got 50 answers and they're already in my body. I don't have to think it through and try to figure it out while they're wait while I'm wasting their time. I can just deliver the result. But mm -hmm. that's what it takes to master something. And so you need immersion. And so do you, uh, does it require hunger? Yes. But hunger can be awakened. Something I have no hunger, I have no interest, but then they see something that really excites them or they go through a painful enough moment or they get an environment where they see what's possible. And that's what happens in our environments. Okay, so let me run an idea by you. I, I will frequently get parents ask me who they just, their kids are really struggling. They don't know what to do. And um, I always give them, here's the backstop reality. If you absolutely must get a change in your child's behavior, I'm gonna tell you what will work. You're probably not going to do it, but I am convinced it will work every time. Uh, you're gonna have to kidnap them. You're gonna take them somewhere remote and you're going to put them in a group of people, in, in the company of a group of people that they respect. And to earn their respect, they're gonna have to change their behaviors into what you want them to do. So assuming that you want them to do something that's actually good for them, uh, stop doing drugs, stop wasting time, living in fear, whatever, and you put them in that group and they're gonna have to conform to the, the core values of that group, which you will have you know, brought them together for that reason, that they have positive, uplifting core values. But the key mechanism for me is that to gain acceptance from these people that are worthy of respect, they will have to conform. But I think they have to want their respect. Do you think there's any of that? Or 
en masse, can people do this in isolation? Well, of course people can do it in isolation. People do it all the time in isolation. Your strategy is a really good strategy. And, uh, you know, I have five kids and five grandkids. Um, my second youngest boy um, uh, had an experience where when he was 16, he got caught up, you know, he went to school at uh, Le Rose in Switzerland, an amazing school. He wanted to go so badly. I had the contacts. I thought, man, if I could have done this, gone to school. His uh, roommate was the king of Oman's son who had at 16 years old or 15 years old, actually, they were 15 at the time. He already had 14 cars, every kind of Ferrari, everything you can imagine. He had a different Rolex or, you know, $50,000 watch each day. And so my son, who I said, you're going to work your ass off during the summer to help pay for this. Here's how it's going to work. My son then uh, kind of adapted to that environment and unbeknownst to me, the woman in my life at that time gave him a credit card and oh. at 15 years old, he spent over $100,000 competing with the Kings and Queens kids Whoa. and started doing drugs, you know, light drugs, or, you know, smoking dope and so forth, pot, uh, gained over a hundred pounds. Wow. And I, I, when I first went to see him in Switzerland, you know, they won't let you come for the first three months. They're very strict. They want the kids to adapt. And he gained like 25 pounds. And I pulled the counselor aside and said, listen, this isn't right. And he's like, no, this is initial transitions. We see this all the time. He's going to play rugby. He's going to lose weight. Well, over the next year and a half, he gained over 100 pounds. So I got him out of the school. I brought him back to the U.S. And sure enough, within a very short time, I had to do an intervention on him. And because one of his friends told me what was really going on with him. And so I did the intervention. He's not my blood child. So he said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to call my real father who, you know, was a nice man who provided, you know, his physical sperm, but had not been around most of his life. I've been you know, I've been raising Josh at that point since he was five years old. Really painful situation. But if you're a father, you got to do whatever it takes. And so I knew what he needed was what you described. He needed an environment where he had to earn everything, because unfortunately, his mother and I were divided and she was giving everything on the side. So he had no sense of inner pride. It's like when people talk about self-esteem, I, I hate the term, it's so overused, but self-esteem does not come from what other people say to you. Someone can tell you your whole life, you're beautiful, you're strong, you're smart, and you cannot trust yourself or not think so. Someone can tell you you're a piece of crap and you go, I'll show you. And some part of you like, grows as a result. So it has nothing to do with what people say to us. Self-esteem is earned by yourself for yourself. It comes from doing something that's incredibly difficult and no one else knows it, you know it. And that's why you have esteem for yourself. So he had none of that. So I got him in an environment and, you know, he said, you can't make me do anything. And, you know, he was 17, almost 16 at this point. And I said, you know, as long as I'm your father, I can make you do anything. And I put him in this environment where they took away everything, cut his hair, and he had earned it the right to use salt and pepper. He had to learn that he had to, he had to be responsible for things. It wasn't so much respect. It was pure punishment reward. You know, it's like real basic conditioning in the very beginning. Now, my son is a very smart kid. <laughs> He's an adult now. He's completely transformed. This is 20 years ago. But he manages to get the owner of this facility to say, I've run this for 20 years. I've never seen a faster turnaround than your son. He's obviously your son. He was applying all these tools. He's helping other kids. He's being amazing. And so normally they stay there for a year and he'd only been there two months. And of course I missed him, his mother's crying. And so we brought him back. And within a month he was doing drugs and, and stealing from us. So I put him back in the environment for a year. He lost 120 pounds. He's never gained it back. He developed a different set of value systems for himself. And Josh today, you know, 25 years later, I have two grandchildren from him. He's my partner in several businesses. We've taken from zero to $4 billion to give you an idea. I mean, and I couldn't be more close to him, but it was one of the more difficult times. So yes, sometimes you got to do an environmental change because the environment they're in reinforces the behavior they're in, the, the beliefs they're in, the way they live that they're in. And that's not an easy thing to do. But so what you're talking about is an extreme. A lot of people do it with things like uh, Outward Bound, right? It's a great piece. A lot of people take their kids who are, you know, wasting away and they put them in an environment where they're in, in, in nature and they can't survive without taking on the challenges and the people around them. And so that's another shaping device like that. So I'm a big believer in immersion where someone has to grow, where it's not a should grow, it's a have to grow. There's no choice. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when I work with people, what I basically do, if you watch me, is I ask questions, I do different things, but I basically put the walls from on the side and behind them, come in and in and in, and there's only one way forward, and magically they move that direction. That's my job, right? So I know how to do that in lots of different ways that don't require me taking somebody off for, you know, a year and setting them aside. But uh, I, I just want to point out that in some cases with drug use and things of that nature, your approach 
would be a very good approach. It's not necessary. You could take somebody for a few days aside and put them in a new environment and have them completely rewire how they are. Because remember, everything is conditioning. So the habits you have, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you perceive life is conditioning. Any condition pattern can be changed with new conditioning. And it doesn't take as long if you know what you're doing. You know, they did research at UC Irvine years ago. And I don't support this research, but this is what they did. They take a monkey and they take down four of his fingers. And then they just bend his finger manually 10,000 times. So if you do this right now, if the people at home say, if they say, well, your finger, how'd you do that? They go, I don't know, I just thought it. Well, well, when they untape the monkey's finger, guess what? He does this for no good reason. It's conditioned. Imagine every time you bend the finger, you're putting a thread of connection between neurons, nerve cells in the brain. It's not fancy. Just think of nerve cells. Do it again, two strings. 10,000 times, you're wired, right? Well, some people are going on the way to work every day and they get off on the same on-ramp and one day they're on the phone and they don't need to go that off-ramp and they get off on it automatically, right? They're like a monkey. They've been trained. But what UC Irvine found is they could interrupt this pattern and they could create a new pattern and it didn't take 10,000 bends to do it if they stimulated the pleasure center of the brain. If they stand in the pleasure center while they bent the finger, they got like a hundred strings of connection. So two dozen of these produce what they used to get from 10,000. So I use that principle in what I do. That's why people enjoy it so much. It's not a pain-driven experience. It's a pleasure-driven experience. Because listen, your brain's going to avoid pain any way it can, and it's going to move towards pleasure. Well, if I can get you to link pleasure to what you need to do so it doesn't take willpower, because look, willpower never lasts. I got a lot of willpower. I know you do too, but there's a limit to willpower. There's no limit to when you link pleasure to something, how far your body, mind, and soul will push towards it. So it's really changing what you link pain and pleasure to that creates lasting change. If you want to learn more about this topic, check out this interview. I work out roughly um, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. Sometimes I might be able to get out a bit faster. Uh, sometimes I have to get out faster if I've got a lot going on for the day, but that is the basic cycle. Put in the work, you will definitely get the results.